Folks, are you ready for this? While writing out a basic biblical hermeneutic study of the seven churches of Revelation for today's message, it sounded kind of rather prophetic to me. So let me know what you think. In the end times, a time comes when the world decides, like Ephesus, what is permitted and desirable, leading many to reject their first love for God, reject their identity and their national identity. This comes when Smyrna's woe and hopelessness and persecution is unleashed against any who resist inside both the church and the world. This is unleashed from Satan's throne by forcing compromise or else. From all those in both the secular world and the church who are bound to the high, lofty pride of Pergamum, they deliberately implement fire tires, odor, and stench of affliction, so all join in with Jezebel's prophetic one-world global rule. Then the majority of people become Sardis dead to their national identity, their church identity, to instead they become identifying with the dragon's bloody red ones. However, a faithful remnant, Philadelphia, whose strength is in Jesus Christ alone, they keep God's word true by refusing to stain the character of Jesus Christ. They look up for a promised escape from the hour of trial to come upon the earth and grow weary. But for the rest, they become lukewarm, complacent, and in need of nothing, absolutely blind to what's going on around them. In this last Laodicean age, people are conquered, right for worldwide conquest at the time when God is left outside their door, knocking to come on in. And they just simply refuse, just as the book of Revelation further indicates. And in Revelations chapter 2.18, it states this, And to the messenger or the angel of the church of Thyatira, write this. And folks, let me stop right here and, and kind of explain thing. Uh, who and what is Thyatira? Well, Thyatira was a prominent city. It was a prominent center of business and trade in the first century world. It was famous for its powerful trade guilds. You could not buy, sell, or work unless you were a member of one of these guilds who worked hand in hand with the local government for the greater good of Rome. Just think of any state-run, um, uh, system or totalitarian system, they become, uh, the government entities become the mother to you and the Caesar becomes the father. So they become your mommy and your daddy, the state is. And that's what was happening here, reinforced by these guilds. The name Thyatira comes from the word Thya, which means sacrifice, and thus the sacrifice of labor are creating an odor, a stench of affliction, or a perfume stench of affliction. Why? First off, these guilds controlled the clothing market, dyeing, leather working, uh, stone masonry, they had restaurants, marketing finances, they made oil lamps, and there's a whole lot of stuff they made because it was a trading center, a big center there, and people are getting rich because, because the guilds, the guilds form sort of like monopolies in their trade and you had to be a member of the guilds in order to uh to to be able to buy sell or eat basically in that city the guild membership was mandatory for anyone pursuing work or starting a business or a trade city you had to comply with a narrative there you had to be a member of one of the guilds to survive those who did not suffer ostracism financial ruin along they lost their gainful employment as well and they became afflicted that's one of the reasons why it's called the odor of affliction here hitchcock's bible and dictionary as well as smith's bible and dictionary likewise the working conditions for employees and the slaves was one of affliction the sacrifice of labor creating hardship for the local population in fact dyeing clothes was one of the main things there making the color purple so forth etc etc dyeing clothes involved the use of human and animal urine thus the the odor of affliction became synonymous with thyatira Next, every trade guild had their own patron deities, pagan deities, basically fallen watchers. They worshipped or titans, whatever you want to say. If you were not part of the club, one of the approved guilds, 
and worship their pagan system and their gods, you'll be cut off from society or else. Sound strangely familiar where we're headed to today, isn't it? You had to show allegiance to the patron gods of the respective trade guild you worked for, and this meant it was mandatory to participate in the rites and rituals and worship of the guild's patron deities, or you could not buy, sell, participate in culture and the life of the city. You were excluded. And the church in, uh, at that time, in the first century, Thyatira faced extreme persecution. Okay? In modern terms, we kind of see this in diversity, equity, and inclusion scores, environmental, social, government scores, and that businesses and corporations, uh, the modern day guild counterparts are putting down upon them, on us right now. You gotta bow down to the correct pronoun. You have to worship gender fluidity or else your silence. Must chant death to your country, your church. You must deny your identity as a human being to be accepted in this new culture. If you go against the norm, it doesn't matter what the United States Constitution says. You, you will rip and shred the Constitution like the Democrat Party did the other day with the impeachment process of Mayorkas. Think about it. Think about where we're headed. Well, Thyatira had one patron deity, this fallen watcher, I would say, over all the gods of every guild, or the fallen watchers you know, of the hierarchy, as Alice Bailey would say. He was known as the sun deity. Uh, would be counterpart in Mesopotamian and Akkadian would be U2 Shamash, okay? But this is who this entity was. The, he was considered in the Greek pantheon as the son of Zeus, symbolized later as the Antichrist to come. His name was Apollo Trimonius. Apollo Trimonius, or Trimonius means a prince who rules or one who rules with absolute dictatorial power as your daddy. Okay, and the state entities and the guilds become your mommy. Okay, your mother. You become your mother. Okay, this is the idea here. That's how Rome was ruled. That's how uh, Nebuchadnezzar ruled. He's the father figure. Government officials are the mother. Okay, you think of that. Think of that hard and heavy. Where our political systems are all going. It's going backwards, folks. Apollo Trimonius was also the deity of light and truth. An intermediary between the gods and men who gives the light of culture. Tells you what culture is. And what music to play. What is poetry. What law is accepted. It includes, he included the, the god over the healing arts. Agriculture. Uh, he was the lord over prophecy. Oracles. Archery. Uh, warfare. Maintainer of civil order. That's who Apollos Trimonius was. He was also known as a plague god, a the destroyer, Apollon, Apollon, who wars against any who come against the absolute use of power to maintain order so all live and be able to live under the excuse of creating peace and safety for all. The location of Thyatira's nearness to Pergamos also has prophetic implications, folks. It really does. Well, how so? Thyatira was a major strategic communication route for Rome. Its location made Thyatira a protective barrier against tax against Pergamum, the capital of the local providence. Remember what I talked about about Pergamum. That's where Satan's throne was with his divine council of evil one resided. If threats were detected, Thyatira could be used to send troops to block any threat to Pergamos from that particular direction, which was a main trade route at that time. Spiritually speaking, uh, the Thyatirian system was quite dark, okay? And they helped protect Satan's throne. That's the idea. And Pergamos meant the high citadel of pride. Just as James Strong and McClintock's Cyclopedia Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature mentions, and I quote here, the best way to thwart any threats to Satan's throne was to make both the world and the church comfortable, affluent, prosperous, and beholden to what was being sold to them, the good life, thus enjoying sexual immorality and sexual immorality with the world system as well, with, with its idols and to the old gods to gain power and prestige over others, end quote. 
it's all about peace and safety and plenty, okay? It's being sold to you. You get a free lunch, a free economic incentive. You, you, you live in this incentive of, let's modernize it, digital currency, uh, universal income. It's going to be a perfect world because the state has become your mother and, your, and the leadership is daddy, okay? And they want Trimonius Apollos here to be your a daddy, the Antichrist. That's just where this is leading here, prophetically speaking here. This describes Apollo Trimonius' role as the chief principality over the city and its numerous guilds that served under the smoke screen of making comfortable, making you affluent, prosperous, by enjoying sexual immorality to create a better, more perfect, equitable world as long as you behave right and for the common good. Mm-hmm. Heard that before? This system dictated and sought to control all aspects of one's life. It dictated who could run for office, what is culturally acceptable, and what is not. These guilds were the catalyst for that mentality, and they were the economic factor that made it happen. And these guilds later became the foundation of secret societies and as well as for philosophic systems in order to gain power to create social order under the disguise of we're doing this for the greater good of all, for your peace and your safety, you comply or die. Or you can't buy, sell, or eat. That theology, that ideology there, I should rather say the ideology there is seen in Revelations chapter 13 about a mark you can't buy, sell, or eat unless you worship the beast in a system. Same thing, same thing. Due to this, the first century church in Thyatira faced hardship and persecution, and thus many succumbed and joined themselves to the system in order to survive. Others did not, and they were persecuted. So how does this correlate historically to the fourth century church age from around 650 AD to 1500? Yeah, and, and, and for today's world as well. How does it fit? Well, from 650 roughly to 1500s, the church was infiltrated to become part of a world system. The Thyatirian church age is often identified as the corrupt or imperial church. You'll see that heading in your Bible, the corrupt or imperial church. It was a time when the church ruled behind kings, emperors, lords, the elite, to keep social control and social order, a new culture, in line. Basically, it's, a, it's sort of like a glorified feudalism, because this was the feudal age, okay, when this, during that time, historically, in the West. And you had to keep things in control and check. You have to live off your citizens' sacrifice of labor by devising means to take their wealth and land away. All for the public good, for the peace and safety of Rome, you know, that's the idea. So let's continue to verse 18, okay? Verses 18 and 19. I'm reading from the King, New King James and King James here. And to the angel of Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flames of fire and his feet like fine brass. This verse is a direct attack on the patron false god of the city, Apollos Trimonius. Jesus Christ is speaking in this verse to his people, reminding them that he is the real Son of God who judges, and he alone has all power and deals out justice. Not this entity who was worshipped in this pagan city, this patron deity known as Apollo Trimonius. In other words, don't confuse the two. He goes on to say in Revelations 2.19, and I put the uh, the Greek word meanings, or key word meanings, in parentheses for you. I know your works, that means your labor, your sacrifice of labor, your love, agape, your self-sacrificing love, service that aids and helps others, that's service, your faith, your trustworthiness, and, you know, your trustworthiness, and your patience, your long-suffering through affliction. That word patience means long-suffering through afflictions. And as for your works, that means your labor, the last, long-suffering afflictions are more than the first. In other words, these people were being afflicted for their beliefs, and so forth, etc. And so, that is what was going on there. So, they had their works. Okay, their labor, what they did for other people was, you know, a lot of uh, 
uh, would you say they helped a lot of people. They had self-sacrificing um, ways to help strangers and people and, and, and their fellow Christians get through rough times. They, 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 they helped each other because they had to in order to survive. And that's what it's talking about. And so in certain churches at this time, and it spread over into modern times now, the idea of this type of church type of person that makes up this group of people, it's all about being afflicted. It's all about suffering. If, how much do you suffer? If you pray, you know, you got to suffer when you pray. You got to throw rice on the floor and make penance and kneel down on rice. You have to uh, do these confessions and these rituals, okay? This is where this stuff came from. That's what the Lord is trying to Im imply. You know, he's only commending them, but he's also pointing to the future to, pe to a certain group of people who are going to be all about afflictions and suffering and certain groups of people that make up this type of church. Okay, okay. look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things. The word few things means exceedingly harshly. I have a few things exceedingly harshly against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Jezebel means the chaste one, the chaste virgin, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and, se and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things to idols. You know, most people just skip over that. They try to decide who in the heck is Jezebel is. Was it this person or that person? And uh, But in fact, the Bible defines who Jezebel was in the book of Kings. She was a real person, a pagan queen who was married to a Jewish king, Ahab. That is exceedingly important that the Bible interprets Bible. Don't go and sit there and go, well, this person could be that person because they sold, die, and this was a particular woman in that church at that time. Just go to sleep. Don't pay attention to any more. It's all done. You know, go to sleep, go to sleep, you know, this has no prophetic significance for today, just, it's all taken care of, don't worry about it, okay. That's pretty much how a lot of, a lot of, um, how this is taught, they get hung up on who Jezebel is, but Jezebel def is defined in the Bible. She was a real person. She ruled behind a Jewish king called Ahab. That is how you interpret who this in individual is, as well as represents. Josephus and others, uh, you know, Josephus was a Jewish historian in the first century, and others state that Jezebel was raised to be a proxy of Azeroth, uh, Iniana, for, or, or Ishtar, or Aphrodite, a.k.a. this is Artemis, the one, the archer, and her brother uh, ha was an archer too, you know, and who the Greeks call Apollos Trimonius, okay, just keep tracking with me. And in other words, the Jezebel was raised to be a, a proxy of Artemis, a proxy, a living proxy. In other words, in modern occult terms, she was to be overshadowed and possessed by Azara. Okay, and so this means that the church began to ha have this Azara, this Artemis spirit, enter into the church. In the Book of Kings, her personality was dictatorial, controlling, scheming. She was a seductress, and one who killed to gain land and wealth. Funny, that was kind of the, if you don't toe the line and walk the system, you know, they want to take your land too, and they'll do anything they can, you know. Are we seeing any of that today by chance in Maine, where they seized over 50 farms? What about Washington State? In certain places in Washington State and counties, they are seizing farmers' land. Hmm, interesting. Who's buying the land in many places? Hmm, interesting. But I digress. So... And she, she was the one who murdered God's faithful people, brought a war against them and false accusations in order, and why she did that, to intimidate the believers and bring them under her control, state control, the mother control of the state, guided by the hierarchy of the gods, known to us as the fallen watchers. She was the chief prophetess of Azra, the one of great authority in pagan world. In fact, Azra's brother, like I said, was Apollo Trimonius, Shamash, Yutu. According to ancient lore, this one 
would come back someday and rise from the abyss or wherever he's put to sleep to come to rule the world. All the triple goddesses, maybe Sybil, you know, with Adonis. Adonis was put to sleep in a cave. She could have her jolly time with them. And so, and then someday they're going to arise out of the abyss and rule the world. Okay? That's the idea. I'm just paraphrasing in a nutshell what this is about, folks. This stuff is really dark. The job of Jezebel was to bring all under the sway of the triple goddess, the divine feminine. Why? To help bring back the one from the, the, the abyss, their new Apollo Trimonius, to do so involves bringing everybody under one roof, including the church. Okay? So in the Thyatirian age, this was what that age was about. Bringing the church under this new system, a new Caesar. Okay? And Jezebel in the church was talking about that. Bringing them so they can rule behind kings and emperors. Bringing the two together. Thus, like Jezebel, um, this system will rule behind governments. It will take land ownership away from the people, take over all business, finances, all cultural mountains of influence, and all religions will be placed under one roof. And in order to do so involves warring against God's people and any who resist. Okay? And you have to have the guilds or the business and corporate world in your pocket to do this. In the 4th century church age, the church became corrupted and became Jezebelian. It became, they were behind the scenes controlling government, kings, armies, business, and financial world of that era. And they were utterly corrupt. The pagan practices and worship was brought into the church in the fourth church age, the Thyatirian age. You can see it with their, 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 their fish hats they wear, wear. Those fish hats that you see a lot of these, these people wear in these types of churches uh, come from the ancient Mesopotamian uh, Reliefs. You see their high priest and stuff wearing this fish hats. That's what I call them, fish hats. They're called something else, but out of respect, I'll, I'll keep keep that to myself, okay? Um, they brought in the mystery religion into the church. They were brought in rites and rituals that must be performed in order to... Uh, to, to, so you can buy, sell, or eat. So you can get a job. So you can work. I mean, this is how bad it was back then. And it was just like the guilds enforced in first century Thyatira, but on a higher level. This entered into the church. This is a matter of historical record. Okay. Another thing that Jezebel did is warred against God's people. And so this church age was known for its war against the saints of God who refused to bow the knee. Okay, great persecution arose, okay, because it was a one world religion with a g gunning to create a one world state to rule behind to gain all power and wealth so that the Trimonius Apollos could come back. Okay, or in the other language, their version of Christ can come back. I want you to think about it. It's a matter of historical record. I don't have time to go through all the points and details about this right now. Next, Jezebel name means the chaste one. Always virgin. That's, that's strange. She was always virgin, yet she was a loose, loosey prostitute. <laughs> uh, being named the chaste one is a swipe at Genesis chapter 3.15. That through the woman's seed will come one who will crush the serpent's head. So the devil is saying, I'm going to have my chaste one who's going to bring forth my champion to defeat God, the Demiurge. Okay, this, goes, this is ancient Gnosticism. That's all it is. It is the occult version of the virgin birth. That's what it is. How so? Each of the triple goddesses had lovers who were assigned to either live in a cave like Adonis or like Demi, Demimus, uh held deep within the abyss. These men were, all, were always somewhere inside the earth in hopes to be set free again once they learned their lesson and saying come back and rule the earth after a bit of housebreaking. Um, in other words, he can't come back and tell the vestiges of manhood that God for men to be is erased and achieved by horribly altering your manhood. Why? So humanity can embrace the male figure to come who takes charge, 
when men do nothing to stop it. Jezebel's spirit is that spirit that emasculates manhood. Okay? And, and some types of manhood need to be emasculated because it's not manhood. You don't beat your wife. You don't be dominant. It's, you need to go back and get your head screwed on straight about that. Okay? But to be a man is to stand up and defend your wife, your family, don't divorce, so forth, etc. Take care of your family. You're a man. Man up and take care of your wife, your kids. You have to answer to God for that as a Christian. You don't dominate and, and be legalistic in the ogre, okay? I won't get into all that. So, the Jezebelian spirit wanted to destroy manhood. Why? So, the humanity will embrace this Antichrist figure to come. And real men are so emasculated they won't do anything. And you wonder why? They're, why is the world going to hell in a handbasket? Let your mind wander and find out the answer. Well, Jezebel, the chaste prostitute, which is a twist on words here, is the one who spiritually, listen to me, Jezebel, the chaste one who is a prostitute, is the one who spiritually births the Antichrist to come upon the earth. Okay? Bringing this about involves Jezebelian tactics. What are these? What am I talking about? Jezebel ruled behind the scenes to influence King Ahab and to bring bring the Judaic religion under the same pagan system fitted for the state, all, so that all live in peace and safety. It's all about peace and safety. In modern times, it seeks to make a global nationalistic state household. Okay? You rule behind the scenes to rule the business and financial and corporate world. That's very important. you got to get the guilds in line. How? Then next you, what do you do next? You bring in science and the arts and entertainment, media, education, philosophy, psychology, military, police to serve under one ideology. You get them all on the same narrative. And if not, you, you, you're, you're not a part of the club. You're not part of the guild. Okay? This is brought about by restructuring the family, destroying manhood, okay, by in, and, and womanhood, destroying both manhood and womanhood in childhood. you got to destroy all three, direct the family so people go to the state, okay, daddy. They, they want their daddy, okay, and their mommy, the mommy state and the daddy ruler, okay, that's the idea here. This is to increase government overreach to enforce iron control over the clay of humanity to prepare the way for the Antichrist so he can come back. You have to do this in their mindset. Okay? Revelation chapter 2 verse 20 says this. And Jesus goes on and says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Again, this involves calling oneself a prophetess. Thus, you are to control the prophetic voice of the church. Okay? This is infiltrated so many places right now. The prophetic voice of the church is being infiltrated. Okay? What is the chief role of Old Testament prophets? Moses laid down the law. Others came forth and warned of the erring to return back to God. And others taught the ways of God. Those were the primary functions of a prophet. So therefore, Jezebelian spirit um, in the church uh, comes, what? To control the prophetic voice. It lays down the law. If you don't gel with the state or the narrative, it's curtains for you. You have to become an, an affirming church, okay? You have to fly these multicolored flags or you're not in with the crowd. We'll silence you. you won't, we will get rid of you. Okay, I just read today that a certain segment of the government is ready to uh, to close down Christian universities. They want to shut down Christian universities. I kid you not. I just read that today on uh, go to on Fox News um, as well as uh, Newsmax. It's little articles you'll find buried in their news pages, and you'll find that there. And you know that's what they do. And so they warn the airing. If you don't comply, we'll silence you. Okay? So they teach the ways of their God, which is mother, state, the state, and daddy, 
the emperor or the president or whatever your rulers are. So look at the next verse. This is very telling. In verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. What does all this mean? God said, into this group of people, you need to turn away from this. He's still talking. Even in the last later to see an age, when all seven groups of people that make up the seven churches manifest all at the same time. All because what the later to see an age produces. Okay? And so so from that time, verse 21 has been in, in effect. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. What, that, what does that verse mean? Jezebel's name means the chaste virgin. In occult terms, one who is spiritually is to birth the Antichrist to come into the world. Maybe climb down and do any honest descent into the underworld to bring back their demiuse, their lover. You know, just look at some of the Taylor Swift videos out there. Some of her older videos have the same imagery in it. There's a term. There's a new philosophy that came out in the fourth church age that is extremely important to grab a hold of. And I suggest you go to Wikipedia and type in the phrase Mother Church. I dare you to try that. And Wikipedia is not the best source, but they give you a, just a brief overview of what Mother Church is. And I quote Wikipedia. And it says, Mother Church or Matris is a term depicting the Christian Church as a mother in her function of nourishing and protecting the believer. It also refers to the primary church of the Christian denomination, Archdiocese, a, i.e., a cathedral type church. Okay? That's exactly what it means. Okay? The term has identical meanings within differing church practices. For example, the Anglicans, the Liberals, the United Methodists, and any apostolic sees, eastern or western, all refer to the church as Mother Church. As Wiki states, the Roman Catholics refer to the Catholic Church as the Holy Mother Church. I'm not trying to, uh, there's some good people in these churches, don't think that everybody who goes to these churches are, 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 are heretics or not. There are some fine people in these who love Jesus and they don't know the depths of Satan, just like we'll read in these verses, okay? But the idea here is very important, it's Mother Church, end quote. So all these denominations have a soiled history ruling behind government entities, kings, emperors, and whatnots, okay? Why? To mother and nurture the common people to submit to the iron will for the good of all, or else they cannot participate in society. The idea of Mother Church is to birth into them strange ideologies, rituals, to nourish and protect them as a mother would. And thus, with that in mind, Jezebel was the chaste and ever-virgin prostitute giving birth before marriage, to mother many to take over the cultural mountains of influence so their Messiah, the who we call the Antichrist, can return. That simple, folks. That simple. Okay? That is not the church's role. The Lord God Almighty brings people unto himself through Jesus Christ and the work of cross and the resurrection and by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit sanctifies you. The church is never a mother. The church is symbolized as the bride of Christ, as well as his own body on earth, as 1 Corinthians chapter 12 clearly states. We're made of many members, but not each, all members don't have the same function. The bride of Christ is not a false, chaste prostitute who births many believers and mothers them all and nurtures them all. That goes back to ancient paganism goes back to the Azariah, goes back to Jezebel. The new birth comes from the Holy Spirit, not an organization. The indwelling Holy Spirit teaches us, guides us into all truth, comes alongside to help us and nurture our faith to be in Christ alone and not an institution. In the fourth century church age, that's the Thyatirian age, as well as in the last church age, Age, all Thyatiran believers are called to repent, but sadly, most will not leave Mother Church. However, some will, but the majority in the last of the last of the last days will not. Why not? Okay, that's the question. Well, they set up a Nicolaitan hierarchy. They have to lord over the people, to conquer the people here. They set up a, have someone have victory over the people, to make sure the people submit to 
mother church. So they will bring forth uh, a, a, a male figure who will rule the world to come. Okay, Their version of Christ, which we call the Antichrist. So the Nicolaitan leaders have a hierarchy. And basically it's the old... Uh, it's, it's your Azeroth, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the people that Elijah on the mountain, uh, you know, called down fire on heaven and destroyed. <laughs> okay? And the ones that, uh, when people got sick of Ahab and there was a war happened and Ahab was killed, so all the people turned on the prophets of Baal at the time and got rid of them too. It's, it's, these are those people, okay? That's a Nicolaitan type idea. It's just all kinds of sexual perversion and all stuff going on. I won't get into all that. Okay, they set up Nicolaitan's leaders as lords and masters to interpret what the Bible says. They use the prophetic wrongly. Instead of uh, prophesizing, they claim to speak on God's behalf because God is doing a new paradigm shift because the old way to share the gospel ain't working. You'll start hearing that. Maybe, possibly, you might even be hearing that now. What is that new thing they want to bring forth? It's called dominionism. It's church-state relationship. Okay, the church rules behind the state to mother people. Because in the pagan world, the state mothered people. Think about it. Protestants also have their own versions of this through church history, like John Calvin did in Geneva. I'm sorry to pop your bubble, but uh, John Calvin brought a version of dominionism into Geneva. It's just a matter of historical record. He was thrown out of there for that. Mm -hmm. In the late 1980s, Earl Polk shared the same goal, to take over all the cultural fears of influence so Jesus can return with them on top of the food chain. Basically, to sum it up. After this, and only then, just as in paganism, can the Messiah return with them handing the governorship of the world over to Jesus and thus earning their place as co-rulers with him for a thousand-year reign of Christ. No different than ancient paganism's idea here. Remember, Jesus says he has eyes of fire. So he says, hey, look, church, uh, here, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ. You're confusing the two. Don't confuse the two. Dominion is a modern form of ancient Gnosticism which traces back to the old pagan god storylines of the one to come, a Nurgle, a Marduk, who comes to defeat the Chaos Monster, the Demiurge, the Judaic Christian God, in one final battle by using secret weapons depicted as a spear or an arrow. Think about it. Notice that the triple goddesses all use arrows and spears. Artemis, Athena... Okay, or even a mace, you know, big club. The symbolism is telling, isn't it? The triple goddess will disarm people to get their pagan false god to come on earth in one final battle. They'll use the arrows of DEI, ESG score, surveillance state, and the spear of World Economic Council to make a brave, new, more inclusive, uh, equitable world, or else you won't, you can't be mothered by the state. Dependent upon the breast milk of government for all thy needs. So you'll see political philosophies like this. They want to get rid of Christianity and Jews. They want to get rid of anybody, conservatives, atheists, I don't care who you are. But whoever believes in freedom, liberty, your national identity is now what? The enemy. Okay. We're going to see this build to a crescendo in the last church later to see an age. Okay, they want everybody to depend upon mother government with mother church joining in with mother government in order to birth this ruler back on the planet. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 21 and 23. Indeed, I'll cast her Jezebel, the chaste mother, <laughs> into a sick bed of affliction and sickness. The word means a sick bed, means a, a bed of affliction and sickness. Well, the, the, the message is very poignant. Those who will not repent for colluding with the Jezebelian spirit, corrupting the church to come in line with the one world governmental religious system, uh, the rule behind the governments, which Revelation chapter 9 and 13 speak of, will be cast into a bed of affliction. Think, <laughs> okay? 
Okay, let, let me try to explain what that means. In ancient paganism, there was a bed of some false deity or titan, where they committed orgies and affliction with others to, to, so the de deity could prove their power, power, prowess and dominance overall. Because sex rights in, invoke dominance. Okay, I won't get into all that right now. One such bed, in fact, is described in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, belonging to King Og, who is described as being a remnant of the giants, which was, this bed was nine cu cubits in length and four cubits in width. In other words, it was 13 foot, 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide, which was used in pagan sex rites that openly displayed dominance and sexual paralysis or submission to daddy. And Azra would be Mother Church, the chaste one who prostitutes herself on this bed of affliction. That's what Revelations is talking about. The idea of dominance is also seen in Second Samuel, chapter 16, verse 22, when Absalom set up a tent on a roof with a bed and had his way with all the uh, women concubine of David. The same reason, the same pagan reason. Uh, he's, he's now daddy. Not, 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 he's, he's the king. Okay? That's what he's saying. Submit or else. This will happen to you. Very poignant symbolism. How mother government, you know, this word starts with an S, has a W at the end and E D. That's <laughs> what mother government likes to do to the people. If you, and enjoy it. <laughs> the idea of dominance, that's all it's about. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 21 through 23, and I'm going to start reading this in common at the same time. It says, Indeed, I'll cast her, Jezebel, into a sickbed of affliction and sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. So this is a bed of orgy. Okay? Those who commit fornication with her to achieve power and dominion will go into the great tribulation. That's what it's saying. When you read that verse now with what I just said, they commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent. This is what it means. Either committing sexual immorality is defined in the chapter with world governments. The church in bed with the state to be mother. Think about it. Just think real hard and heavy about it. What philosophy comes to your mind? Political philosophy uh, that wants to, to be the mother. Why Marxism? Totalitarianism, totalitarian democracy, socialism, fascism, all, all it. Put that bill. Those who commit fornication with her, uh, why? To achieve power and dominion over the people. They're going to go into the Great Tribulation. Revelations chapter 18, verses 8 through 13, defines these as the great men and merchants of the earth who will go into this affliction. And you read about it in those chapters. Now think back to the Thyatira guilds and what that system has morphed into today with the World Economic Council. And just today, uh, mashed potato heads signed over our medical sovereignty over to who? I bet you wonder, don't know who who is, but he signed it over to who. And if you don't know who is, you need to read some news articles about to find out who he signed it over to. Okay? So, folks, with that, remember and recall what I stated about the concept of Mother Church and her children. And the verse 23 of Revelation chapter 2 is going to make a lot more sense. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and heart. And I will give to each one of you according extremely harshly to your works. So folks, we have a Jezebelian type leaders who seduce the Thyatiran folks to commit spiritual adultery with the world system in the political bed of the state. To do what? Infiltrate? And take over the church and the world. Bring all under this uh, system. For your peace and safety, of course. In fact, occultist Alice Bailey channeled this plan to the occult world on how to infiltrate uh, this into the church. This idea of dominionism into the church. He was 
she laid out the plan back in, I think, from 1925 up to the 40s. She laid this out in Externalization of Hierarchy and other works, okay? How to infiltrate the church and bring dominionism into the church to become part of a new one-world religion. She's very big on creating a one-world religion so that their champion, she called the Christ or the, or the, the, the silent watcher who is almost sinlessly perfect can come back into the world to rule all. I kid you not, to create a new utopian world order of peace and safety enforced by a mommy state, a mommy religion, to worship daddy, the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 2 verse 24, Now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no other burden on you. Revelation 2.25 says, But hold fast what you have till I come. Verse 26, And he who overcomes, everywhere in the seven churches where it says overcomes, it means continuously overcomes. In verse 26, over, continuously overcomes and keeps, continuously guards, protect my works, meaning the works he approves of until the end. Not their works, but the works that he approves of. So what are the works that the Lord approves of? of? In other words, the first thing is don't fall for dominionism. Uh, because a lot of people in these churches have no clue of the depths of Satan. And they're to told to hold fast what you have until Jesus returns. What do, they, what do they hold fast to is seen in verse 19. Their labor of love. Their service that aids and helps others. Their faith in God's trustworthiness. Their patience and long-suffering through afflictions is how they continuously overcome. They understand that the church is no longer your mommy and the state is not your mother, okay? You have to forsake this idea, okay? And, and, and let me just make this disclaimer. It is a good thing to get involved in government systems and school boards. It's a good thing that Christians do. If the if we had a, re, a groundbreaking spiritual awakening here in the Western world, uh, guess who's going to be the political leaders? There'll be more Christian, and more, things will have more order, more make more sense, and they're going to, and we're not going to have all this craziness. You're not, you're not going to have people who pretend to be something they're not in sports events and injuring another weaker lesser person are dominating them you know you know you won't have that you want people bending the knees and hating and, and chanting death to their own countries you have you'll see your streets uh cleaned up you'll see potholes and streets paved you'll have some things go right that's what you what you have and you have people in here with the know that with, with a respectful fear of God in them, not fear that they're going to be beaten up, but that they have a respect for God, not to stain his character and name by what they do, but they're to rule justly and fairly, <clears throat> rule with grace, rule with freedom and liberty. I'm not talking about that. If you had that type of wave come in, you would have a mass population of people who are Christians, and they would influence the government, just like it has for centuries, from the founding of the United States on. You in Europe, you had the same foundation. It became corrupted through the cathedral churches. Think about it. I'm not pulling any punches. I'm just telling you. Um, so, so you said, hold fast what you have. You know, it's your service, helping others and all that. Trust in God's trustworthiness. If those type of people get into halls of power naturally through a mass revival that's far different than a small minority of people joining in with the state to take over the seven whatever quite different okay so let me get back on track in order to do any of this will take a humble heart it takes a sacrifice of labor and by affliction that comes by helping others and doing good for each other, for the poor and the needy, all guided by the wisdom that comes from Jesus through the Holy Spirit, not some dictator, whether it be in state or church. Listen to the promise that Jesus made to these folks 
in verse chapter 2 of Revelations, verse 26. And he who over, overcomes, continually overcomes, and keeps continuously guards, protects my works, meaning the works that Jesus approves of that I just read, until the end, I'll give him power and authority over the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Verses 27 and 28 explains that it is Jesus who rules over the nation during his 1,000 year reign on earth, and that they rule by their labor of love their service that aids and helps others, teaching faith to trust in God's trustworthiness, rule by showing patience and long-suffering, alongside of Jesus, not ruling as lords and masters, but as servants to all. Think about what I'm saying here. Do you see how the Jezebelian spirit can take scriptural truth and twist it? To infiltrate the church in the 4th century church, and bring it to its conclusion in the fourth Laodicean age? Think about it. Jesus promises to give himself, for he is the bright and morning star. That verse talks about promising, giving them the, um, the morning star, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Just as Revelation chapter 22, verse 16 says that he is the bright and morning star. So these people will, will, will be able to uh, give themselves over to the real bright and morning star, not the fake bright and morning star of Ishtar, the triple goddess. They get away from Mother Church. They get away from uh, Mother State. Get away from Daddy, uh, Tyrant, the Antichrist, or the, or the President. Think about it. He get, they're going to get. They're going to rule alongside of Jesus, and be servants to all, not lords and dictators. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Think about how that's been twisted into dominionism. Think about it. Revelations two twenty nine. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, folks, let me just kind of wrap this up. During the last church age, the Laodicean age, is a time when the events described in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 concerning the ch seven churches all come together during a time when the ambiance of the church blends with the world's idea of becoming rich and in need of nothing and blind to God. Mm -hmm. This causes great complacency within five of the churches, or groups of people, or people who make up these churches, and breeds the apostasy that Paul writes about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, so that they remain blind to the arising persecution, blind to the importance of the true faith in Christ alone, blind to what it really means to stand and tend and keep his word, blind to staining Jesus' character by their actions, blind to the importance of overcoming these things. And what you'll see is a male stripper on a pole, in a men's conference in a church, you'll see all kinds of strange things in churches that apostatize in this day and age, in this time period. Revelation 2.29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. With that, folks, I'm going to con conclude. I'm going to conclude with this. Just, I'm just going to pray. And you can repeat after me. You can put your hand on your heart like I always tell people to do. If you, if you like, you don't have to. And I'm just going to pray this prayer and you can make it your own. I'm just going to pray it and you can play it back. Just listen to it. Just listen. So just listen to this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord God Almighty, open my eyes to see where I, where I have been deceived. Release me from any form of dominionism I may have been involved with. I repent. Help me turn away in Jesus' name and cleanse me. I ask you in Jesus' name, fill me always with your Holy Spirit's resurrection power, so I no longer fall prey to every wind of doctrine which men lie in wait to deceive. Heal my broken heart that causes this. Strengthen my hurting spirit with your good news. Set me free from what holds me captive, and free me from what oppresses me. I ask this in Jesus' name. And help me, in Jesus' name, be a better reflection of you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 
with that folks i'm going to conclude today's uh video and if you would like to contact or support what i do all my contact information is on the screen i never will call you i'll never beg you for money okay i'm just saying i, I will not i'll let god put that on your heart if, if that's so so be and um I'm just glad to be able to teach the gospel and preach the gospel and give you some insights to make sense out of the haywire we're seeing in the world today. With that, you guys be blessed in Jesus' name.